All the time? God is good. Look at somebody and say, somebody? I'm glad you're here. We all got a choice where we're going to be, what we're going to do. Sometimes we make the wrong choice. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, place to get us going. Sometimes we forget how God comes after us, don't we? We didn't realize it. The truth is, He's coming after all of us. He's already come after us. The unfortunate thing is, sometimes we don't recognize it or sometimes we ignore it. And there's a day coming when we're going to wish we'd have paid more attention. Well, we would wish we wouldn't have blown off church, and we're going to wish we wouldn't have blown off some of the people in our lives that the Lord was trying to use to speak to us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, Now as to the time and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but from t- obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Pray with me. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to come. And so, Lord, I just pray for an alert spirit in this place, God, that we hear some of the things that you have to say about what's coming for us. And, God, we would be prepared and we would be ready. And, Lord, you would speak to our hearts today about the task at hand, where we're at and where we're going. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We need you in this place, God. Move and dwell amongst us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So let me ask you a question. What would you do if you knew that somebody was coming tonight or this week and they were coming in and they were going to break into your house and they were going to take the stuff out of your house and potentially they were going to harm your family and they were going to wreak havoc on everything you have? What would you do? Would you set up a system? Would you get a plan where, you, where that you were ready to at least uh, go, come against this thing? Would you, be, would you do something? The answer is yes, we all would do something. We all would have some idea of something we would do. But here's the thing we don't understand, that there is a plan that's working against us all the time in our lives. And it may not be coming to get steal our stuff at our house, but we have this very real real enemy that we talked about a couple weeks ago, and he's got a plan in, in place, and he's always looking, and he's just waiting for a moment where we're not paying attention, where we're not ready, and he's entering into our families, he's entering into our house, he's entering into our individual lives, and he's stealing from us, and we're sitting around blind saying, well, I go to church, and I've been saved, and we don't even realize how he's wreaking havoc in the midst of everything that he's that we're doing and we simply need to pay attention we need to be looking so if you've been with us this series we've 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 been talking about theology and and that being said is we're trying to gain some knowledge somebody say I need to gain a little knowledge we're trying to grow a little bit more about this good good father that loves us and we're trying to grow a little bit more and understand that the, his ways and what he what he has for us so that we can relate to him and we can know who we are in Christ Jesus as children 
of God, and, and hopefully it helps us to, to live a life in, in relationship with Him that glorifies Him. And so we're kind of ending this, this series today. Let me ask you this. Has anybody enjoyed this series? I mean, just kind of studying and hearing some stuff. Some of it's simple, but just to kind of grow a little bit. I know it's, it's yeah, it stretched, stretched me a little. And so today we're going to kind of wrap this up, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about it's coming next. We're going to talk about eschatology. Somebody say eschatology. You're so educated. And what that means is the end times. What's in front of us? The unknown for some of us. This is a topic that's been so many different things and opinions. It's been misused. It's been misabused. It's been misunderstood. People are afraid of it. People think they're experts on it. There's all kinds of, of stuff. And, and so we're going to try to get an idea about this because sometimes we think about our future we just we don't really know what's coming we don't know what's in front of us and how many of you know that the word of God amazingly tells us what's ahead of us you know the word of God this word of God that half the our, our culture is thrown away and we don't think it's useful anymore and our government thinks it's irrelevant and our society says it's like a fable, this Word of God, you know, that's unlike the world that's changing and, and man who changes ways and thinking the Word of God, Isaiah 40, verse 8, you know, the flower fades and the grass withers, but the Word of the Lord is forever, and it tells us some stuff that we need to be getting ready for and preparing, yet our culture ignores it, acts like it doesn't matter. The Word tells us this. The Word tells us that there's a point coming, and it's moving forward to this big climax, Okay? And the story goes is, is that God wins. God wins. And, and by the way, Jesus, somebody say Jesus. He is the man. He is the man. He's not a good guy. He's not somebody that did some nice stuff. But he is the man. And separate from Jesus, we're all just players in this thing. We're all just filling some sort of a little role. All the greats in history, whether they be kings or rulers or presidents or athletes, authorities of this age, whatever big names that they are, unless they're living for the Lord, unless they're walking in His ways, they're nothing really but pawns. This world that's falling, this world that evil seems to keep rising up, what, what's going to happen is there's coming a point and God is going to intervene. He's coming back again and He's going to reclaim the world and He's going to do away with evil. And here's the reality that those that are in Christ, it's going to be a glorious thing. It's going to be awesome. And for the rest of humanity that doesn't know Jesus, it's going to be horrendous consequences. So we're going to talk about it a little and we understand that the first coming, when Jesus came, what He did was He brought hope. He brought hope and He brought redemption and He brought forgiveness which we celebrate and we hopefully experience today. He brought that to us, to man, by willing, be willing to suffer for us. That was His first coming. But when He comes again, He is going to be the undisputed reigning King. There will be no arguing over, well, I don't know if He's a prophet or if He's a this or He's that or what He like. No, He's going to be the, the undisputed King. And he's going to call to him all of us, all of those who are carrying his name. So here's the question, if we can understand that at least a little bit. What, what is it in between his first coming and his second coming? What, what does this look like in between? Well, I'll tell you this, it has to do with tribulation. Somebody say, look out for some trouble. Are you okay today? tribulation struggles this is such a surprise for so many in the in, in Christ so many in the church because we have this naive mindset that because I'm saved and because I say I believe in the Lord that my life's just going to be without struggle and I'm not going to have issues in my family and I'm not going to have issues in my relationships and I'm going to make plenty of money and everything's just going to be easy for me when in fact Jesus tells us in John 16, verse 33, he says, For these things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace, because in this world you're going to have tribulation, but take courage, because I have overcome the world. 
He says, man, you're going to have some problems because I had problems. And if you follow me, you're going to have some problems. He says in another way in Matthew 24, verse 21, about a time coming towards the end. He says, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be again. Jesus said the same thing. All the writers of the gospel re reported the same thing. He said, it's going to be something that's never happened. And you're going to say, well, how am I going to make it through? Because I can barely make it through the stuff I'm going through right now. Anybody with me? How am I going to make it through this great thing that's never been seen, that even Job didn't experience? How am I going to make it through that something that's greater than what those went through in Nazi Germany? How am I going to make it through? Who will make it through? Those belonging to Jesus. Those belonging to Jesus. Revelation 7, 14. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of this great tribulation. And they, the ones that have been washed, their robes, and made white by the blood of the Lamb. Those that are belonging to and following Jesus. Here's the thing. You and I, we're all going to face struggles. We can be in our prime as a young person. And we can have our athletic career in front of us. And all of a sudden, our knee collapses. And all of a sudden, everything is difficult. I can be bankrolling it, man. I can be rolling and the economy drops. And I went all in one day and Wall Street crashed. And I lost everything. Listen to me. There's going to be struggles in life. We're going to deal with issues. We've talked about this. We live in a fallen world. But listen, we can make it through all of this by the Lord's help and the help of people of God that God places around us. This is why connection is so important because we're connected to Him and we're connected to other people and we can get through this thing together. Somebody say together. There's troubles in life, but we do understand that the Lord speaks of tribulation at a higher level as the end approaches. This is not an all-compassing thing because I'm going to tell you right now, i got enough scripture to wear you out till about 3 o'clock today. But that's not our goal. My goal is to give us an understanding, to grow in knowledge a little bit of, of what is out there because honestly, I think a lot of people, we don't ever think about this stuff anymore. We don't want to hear about it, and we don't, we're not really aware of it. But greater tribulation, it talks about in Revelations. It talks about Satan. It talks about the beast and the Antichrist, and they're all linked together with all the fallen angels, all the demons, and they increasingly work to deceive us. They increases, increasingly work to steal worship from God. In other words, they want to take your attention, and they want to take it off of God, and they want to put it on the almighty dollar. They want to take your attention off of God and they want to put it on a hairy-legged boy or they want to put it on a, a, a hot mama or whatever. They want to take your attention off of God and begin to put it on things in this world and, and begin to deceive us. And what happens is it promises us all this stuff. It promises us the American dream. And so what happens is I start going after the American dream, which seems like it's pretty good, right? But what happened is I don't realize how it's taking my worship off of God and it's beginning to place it on things of the world is placing it on myself and other idols that come up in my life and we don't understand how the enemy is working and deceiving us it tells us there's coming a time one way we'll know when the last hour is approaching in first john 2 18 and 19 it says children how many of you know we're all children of god none of us are experts none of us are know-it-alls we're all children you know why he calls us children because you're at the very beginning of all this. Get over yourself and listen to me, kids. He says, children, it is the last hour, and just as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have appeared, from this we know that it is the last hour. For they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. You see, just as Satan, remember the story? Satan went out of heaven. He was cast out of heaven. And just as Satan went out of heaven, here's the thing. We're going to have people in our life and in our communities and in our government, and they're going to come in for a little while, and then they're going to go out. There will be those who profess to be one of us. I'm all in with you. We love you. We're for you. And then you better watch out because it's going to be revealed, and they're going to 
head out of us. There's going to be a time when there's going to be some that appear magnificently, almost as God, and they're going to be eloquent in their speech, and they're going to look the part, and they're going to say the right stuff, but eventually they're going to begin to oppose God and His work. And I'm not saying that people are the Antichrist, but I'm saying the spirit of the enemy works in people the same way the spirit of God works in people. And sometimes we're deceived because people say all the right stuff, and they put on a show, but on the inside, the enemy's working to bring division and bring separation and beat people down and keep people from walking in the ways of God and 1 John 2 2 says that this is a liar and this is how you know that the enemy is at work because he's going to ultimately de de deny the father and the son and we think well denying God means that I'm saying I don't believe in Jesus and I don't believe in God and that's one way but how many of you know the enemy is tricky the word of God tells us He's very crafty, and he's very subtle. And sometimes the enemy works by denying God, and it's not in words, but it's in action. And it's how they oppose the will of God, and they oppose the things that God's doing in your life. The enemy works through people in your life. When God's doing something, and you're doing good, and then all of a sudden you think about somebody, you're already thinking about somebody that comes into your life or comes into a season, and God's doing some stuff, and all of a sudden it just begins to put up question marks. And you begin to doubt what God's doing. And we see how the enemy uses people and uses situations to begin to deceive us of what God's doing and even how God's calling us to walk with Him. You see, the enemy is going to come, and he's already here, but when these end times come, he's going to, more and more, he's going to manipulate religion. And he's going to claim worship due to God. And I just think if we can be honest, if we look in our culture, and we see how the enemy is manipulating our churches in America, can, can, we, can we just be, like, honest for a minute? Because now we have so watered down the Word of God, where we're not going to preach the truth anymore, but we're going to preach it kind of about the truth because I don't want to offend anybody and I don't want to run anybody off and we're watering it down and the enemy is manipulating religion to make it into something else where it's just a feel-good thing and get you an easy ticket to where you can make it into the big carnival, the big show and, and instead of us preaching the truth and the real Word of God. And so what happens is the enemy's taking us away from this holy, holy God and he's turning it into something else. He's, he's shifting the worship off of God, the true God, onto something else. He's going to demand allegiance to him at some point in our culture already. You think about some of the movements and some of the stuff and it's basically telling us that, hey, if you don't accept us the way we are and if you don't uh, approve of what we're doing, then, then we're going to make it very difficult for you. We're going to persecute you. We're going to put out all kind of lies in the media about you. And here's the thing, that as we try to grow and as we try to stand and we feel the conviction of God and we try to oppose what the enemy's doing, you know what's going to happen? We're going to face more trouble, aren't we? We're going to face more struggle. When I step out of the boat and I say, I'm going to live for Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to do it better than I ever did before, and immediately there's going to be more opposition. It's the same with you and your family. It's the same way. You people all the time say, well, I never had no problem till I started going to church and serving the Lord. And all of a sudden now I'm serving the Lord. And, man, I'm getting attacked from all over. Yeah, you're right, Jack, because you never were a threat. You were aligning with the plans of the enemy. But now that you're stepped out of the boat and standing for God, he's coming after you. He don't want to see you win. He don't want to see you walk in the plans of God because you are a world changer. You are a difference maker. You are the bright and miring star. The Spirit of God lives upon you. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. No way does the enemy want you to begin to know who you are in God. And so he's coming after us. So we could say a lot about tribulations. We could talk a lot about these end times, and I don't I really want to get into all that. That's not my goal. It's just to understand that, number one, we face it, and number two, we're going to face it more as time goes on. In our personal life, I'm going to tell you what, I get attacked more now than 15 years ago when I said yes to the Lord. I get attacked more now than when, in 1993 when I surrendered to God. It goes more and more as time goes on, and this greater tribulation is coming at the end of all of it, just know this, that we face it 
And then we're going to face more. There's not something wrong with you because you face stuff for trying to do right, okay? Probably means you're doing something right. There are three views that believers have. Three views on tribulations. I'm not going to get into it. I'll just tell you briefly. Number one is pre-tribulation. Now we call it the rapture. It means that Christ's coming and he's calling all of his children before the major tribulation. This is going to be in our best interest to pull for this one, okay? We would like for this one to be true. Majority of people, probably this one. But that means that Christ is coming again to call his church home before the great tribulation in this earth, which, by the way, will probably be about a thousand-year reign. It's kind of what the experts say and what Scripture tells us. Number two is mid-tribulation. means in the middle of tribulations, like there's going to be a thousand-year period of, of big-time tribulations. And in the middle of our tribulations, Christ is coming again and rescue us, and then he's going to have a time of peace and then another time of tribulation, and so he's coming in the middle. The third one is post-tribulation, which means that Jesus is coming back to rescue us at the end of the great tribulation. That means that we're going to suffer through all of it, and then Christ is coming back again. So that just gives you a little bit of knowledge on that. Because of these three different beliefs, here's, here's, there's some people that believe that, that he's coming at any moment. He can come right now. He can come before I finish this sentence. The lightning can strike. The sky can split. He comes and pulls us up out of here. In other words, you better be ready. The, the others believe that there's certain events that has to happen. These are the ones that watch everything in the world. If, if the Rahib Shahib over in the Middle East passes gas, well, all of a sudden now we're talking about what's coming next. Listen, look, look. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Jesus says not even the angels in heaven know. But here's the thing, we know, we know that it's coming. Whatever we want to believe and whatever you want to believe, I'm not going to tell you which one to believe. Whatever. But here's what we need to believe, and this is what everybody does agree on, is, is Jesus coming again. Somebody say, he's coming. he's coming. Jesus is coming back again. And check it out, when he comes back, there is going to be resurrection. There's going to be resurrection for believers and non-believers. It tells in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. John 5, 28 and 29. He says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all are in the tombs will hear his voice and they will come forth, those who did good deeds to a resurrection life, that is those believers in Jesus, and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. There's going to be this time when everybody's going to be raised. Now, some believe that, the, that you know, if you're a pre-trib guy, if you're the rapture guy, and hopefully say, I want to believe that. Oh, we take that, Lord. But he's going to come again. He's going to rapture us. The church is going to be, and then it'll be, we, we'll, we'll deal with the Lord then. And then a thousand years later, at the end of it, God will take everybody, raise them, and they will all be judged. That's just one view. But the thing is here, we need to understand that we're all going to face judgment. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're going to be judged. Might make us look at being judged now different. We're just practicing. Just practicing. Go ahead. Judge me. But here's the thing. We don't, we don't like to talk about judgments. We don't like to talk about it in the church. We don't like to talk about consequences for our sin and consequences for our choices because, hey, we want a life-giving church, Right? We want a church that you come and they just love you and you're filled with grace and you're preached every week on prosperity and love and blessings and the healing and favor of the Lord and the streets of gold dust sprinkles come out in your pickup because we preached on the Holy Ghost today coming from heaven and it's going to be awesome and it, you, this is what we want and it's all true. It's all true. This is everything that God is but here's the thing. That once we've tasted and seen, amen, once we've received some of the grace and the mercy and the love and the healing and all the good benefits of God, we've tasted and seen, then here's the thing, we have a responsibility. You see, when I was an orphan, I didn't have to answer to anybody. I just ran around like a hoodlum. I just did whatever I wanted to in the streets day and night. But when I become a child, 
And when I was brought into the family, and when I was asked to give a place to sit at the table, guess what? Now all of a sudden, I have a little bit of responsibility. And this is the issue sometimes where we want all the grace and the love and the goodness and all the good stuff, but then God says, I've given it to you. Now you take your place at the, at the supper table and start living like a child of God. See, we have a little responsibility to begin walking in it. God gives us grace not so that we would slot on it and spit on it and just keep going the way but he gives us grace so that we could taste and see and it would change our life. How many of you know God doesn't give us a band-aid so that we can just keep going the way we're going? He gives us a heart transplant which changes the direction of our life and makes it begin to beat for him. Amen? But all history points to the fact of this, that we're all heading for final judgment. Like it or not, want to talk about it or not, this is where we're headed. We can play games in our culture. We can play games in our society, in our relationships, in our churches. But at the end of the day, at the end of all of it, we're facing judgment. And you say, well, this is the good, good father that y'all sing about. And he leaves the 99 and he comes after the one. And that's exactly who he is, but he's also the ruler of everything. And he's also the lawgiver. And he's also the final judge. In Acts 17, 31, he says, Because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, being Jesus, whom he has appointed, having formulated, furnished proof to all men by raising Jesus from the dead. He said, he's going to judge everything. There's good news. Or it's not good news because John 3, 18 tells us that he who believes in him, being Jesus, is not judged. But he who does believe has already been judged because he did not believe in the one, the Son of God, that he sent. So the unbeliever, when I was in unbelief, I, you know what? I could try to prove and make myself think I was okay and I felt good and I could do some nice stuff and help some people out every once in a while. But at the end of the day, before I really believed in Jesus, I was condemned. There was no arguing. But this judgment that we're talking about at this point is not really about salvation, but this is more about disclosing whether we've chosen to trust in the Lord or our lack of trust in the Lord. And so here's the thing. We all believe in, in the Lord. Our society believes in the Lord. But do we trust in the Lord? Do you trust in God today? This, if you don't hear anything else, hear this today. Do you trust in God today? I don't mean, are you good? I don't mean, have you done some good stuff? I don't mean your works, your efforts. I'm a good guy. I'm a good old fun-loving gal. I, 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 I go to church pretty often. I give a little bit every once in a while. I mean this, do you trust in God? Do we trust in God more than we trust in the things of this world? Do we really trust in God because it's understanding again that we're all going to be judged somebody say we're all judged 2 Corinthians 5 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we may be recompensed repaid accounted for the deeds in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad see this judgment is not really on salvation but this is on appraisal of who we are this is going to be about positioning in the kingdom. This is going to be about positioning about where I'm going to stand and what I'm going to do for the king of glory. See, we need to always be checking our work. Sometimes we, we have this checklist that we mark off the box. and Yeah, I did that, said a prayer, went to church, served over there, kept the kids at one time, showed up at the men's breakfast, went to the women's thing, broke the change, here we go. But do we ever look at our works? And I don't mean being busybodies. I mean, do we ever look at our life? Do we ever look at our heart? Because that's what's going to be revealed. This will be the final judgment. The final judgment at the great throne of God. It talks about in Revelation chapter 20 when he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven even fled away. No place was found for them. And then I saw the dead and the small standing before the throne. The books were open. The first judgment, you either are or you aren't. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according 
to their deeds. There won't be no arguing. It's going to be what's written. What is your life message? What is your life song? This great judgment. So then what happens after judgment? We got two answers. We got two options. It's hell or it's heaven. Which do you want? Not to go hellfire and brimstone today, but hell is not a good place. Hell is the destiny of the wicked, those without Jesus. It tells us, I'm not going to give you all the scriptures because there's too much and I'm out of time, but Mark says it's an everlasting fire. John the Revelator says it's a lake of burning sulfur. It's an utter, it's an utter darkness. It's an eternal torment and punishment. It's unimaginable, and it is awful. You know what hell is? It's the blackest darkness, and it's forever. It doesn't stop. It's utter aloneness. It's complete removal of God's presence. This is the biggest fear for me. This is what I think hell is. It's not so much the suffering and the pain and the agony. That's one thing. But what makes it worse is there's no presence of God there. In other words, we can walk evil, and we can be evil in this world, but there's still the presence of God around us. Given a little mercy, given a little hope, given a window to get out. But with, when we get there, there's no more presence of God. There's no more second chances. There's nothing. There's weeping and clawing and gnashing of teeth amidst the smell of burning sulfur. And I don't know if you've smelt burning sulfur, but it's not pleasant to your nose. Whatever you can picture as a misery, as misery, it's going to be that compounded, magnified, and never-ending. It's important that we understand that, that we're aware of that, because it's eternal. The same word for, for heaven and blessing is the same word for punishment. Matthew 25, 46. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous eternal life. Of course, we don't want to say that. Say, go on, preacher. Y'all didn't say go on, so y'all want to talk about that some more? What we want is heaven, amen? Say, I want heaven. Heaven's the destiny of the righteousness. The righteous means, doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that we're right with God because of Jesus Christ. Heaven is where, the, where God is. It's where his present is, presence is. What it's like, it's like a place of rest. Anybody ever tired? Anybody ever need a rest? Sign me up. It's a place of glory. It's a place of purity. It's a place of worship. It's a place of authentic fellowship where we're not playing games. We're not running behind anybody's back. We're not doing all this stuff in the dark. It's authentic fellowship where everybody's known and everybody is made known and we're all benefiting each other. It's a place of being with God. You don't have to go up. You don't have to create an atmosphere by praying and preaching the word and this worship service. No, you're just in the presence of of God. It's a place where He will wipe away every tear, where there is no more death, there is no more pain or crying or hurting or suffering or arguing or bickering. It's the presence of God in its fullness. And check it out, He's got crowns awaiting for you. Crowns does He have? It tells us that He has a crown of life in James. In 1 Peter, He says the crown of glory. In 2 Peter 4, it says the crown of righteousness. In 1 Thessalonians, it says the crown of rejoicing. This is the one I'm going after. It says the crown of rejoicing because those who have been saved because of our witness for all of those in my life that have called me a fun hater and I've confessed it before that I don't, spend, I don't have enough joy because I'm focused too much on what's wrong and why everybody's whining and all the negative stuff that could happen. I don't have enough joy. This is my favorite because it says we're going to get the crown of rejoicing because those who we've given our witness to, whether we've sown the seed or watered the seed or, or, or whatever we did, man, I want to go around and share Jesus. This is why I love getting to share Jesus because I'm just thinking about I'm going to get a crown of joy one day. I may be old fuddy duddy right now but when I get in the, the presence of God man I'm going to have this big taco sombrero of a crown and I'm going to have the joy of the Lord oh it's going to be good so we've got all these crowns but check it out 
Because in the presence of God in heaven, there is no pride and there is no arrogance. At the very crowns that God's given us, there's only going to be humility that we're going to be like Revelations chapter 4 and we're going to be casting our, care, our crowns on the feet of Jesus, on the throne himself, crying out with the elders in heaven, you are worthy, O Lord, of all worship. You are worthy of honor and glory because you have given us everything and you have created us and it all belongs to you. It's not going to be about what we have. It's going to be about who we are and who we're with. Can I get a witness? And all this stuff that we deal with when everything is made new. How many of you want a new truck? How many of you want a new car? And how many of you want a new woman? I shouldn't have said that. (laughs) Lord, forgive me. That was not you right there. But we want new stuff all the time. And we're coming a day where it's not only going to be new, it's going to be perfect, man. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the final heaven and the first earth had passed away. There's nothing comparing to what is coming. That's what we're going to get to be a part of. And it's going to be this time when there won't be no more arguing or bickering. And when the name of Jesus is shared, Philippians 2 says that the name of Jesus, nobody will be pride. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you can think I'm a holy roller. You can think I've went over the edge. You can think I'm too much, too arrogant, too whatever you think. But I'm telling you that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Tribe, tongue, and nation that Jesus, somebody say Jesus He is the Lord. So I'm going to bring us home. This is our great hope to see Jesus. To see Jesus with resurrection eyes. To see the world and the people that we live in with resurrection eyes. Where I'm not offended anymore and I'm not appalled anymore because I got the eyes of Jesus. And I got this new life in front of me. And this is the way I'm seeing things. This is going to be a sight that as well as we want to see now and as positive as we want to think, man, this is going to be a sight that is mind-blowing, that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard and neither has entered into the heart of man. No matter how big our mind is and our imagination, when we get in the full presence of God, it's going to be unimaginable what we're going to experience and be a part of. Hollywood, if y'all want to come help me. Heaven will be the most dynamic, expanded, exhilarating, explosive experience that we've ever had. And it's going to be for eternity. That's why we sing songs like old songs that I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it's going to be like. When I'm found in your sight, I can only imagine. It's why we sing the old song about the amazing grace. And I can declare that, Lord, when I've been here 10,000 years, I've only yet begun the glory and the goodness of God. We can admit that the world and man is in a messed up condition. And let us not be foolish to think that we're not. And everyone, everybody, me included, we're going to give an answer before a holy and a just God. And it's either going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. It's either going to be with God or it's going to be without God. It's going to be eternal bliss or it's going to be eternal punishment. Because God in his love has done everything. God in his love has done everything to redeem us. He's come after us. He left the 99. In other words, he left heaven. He left the angels. He left it all, and he came after us to redeem us. He's done it all. And here it is. We have to choose it. We have to accept Jesus. And hopefully, as we think for a moment, not to... Be fearful at all. But to have an awareness of what's, what's going coming down the pipe, man. Have an awareness of what we're facing. Because, see, if, we're, if we have Jesus, do you understand? If we have Jesus, we're not going to face the first judgment. We may go through some stuff. It's going to be difficult. But the judgment that says either heaven or hell, we're not going to be judged because we belong to Jesus. And so we're, we're in. Now, we'll face the judgment that... Hey, give an account for everything you've done and your attitude and what I'm going to have you doing in heaven, whether it's working cattle or picking a guitar or what. I don't know what it's going to be. Probably me. It'll be a worship leader because I sing so well. But (laughs) 
It'll be in and out on the first judgment. And then the second judgment is going to be receiving what we deserve, the final stamp, punishment. Now that we have some idea that what awaits us, can I remind you that that silly little analogy of knowing that somebody's coming to break in to your house tonight, if we begin to bring that down and apply that to the spiritual realm of our life and see ourselves as the temple of God, the house in which the Lord resides, would we not consider who's trying to break in and how the enemy's trying to bring destruction in our lives, in our families, parents, As you're going after the stuff that you want, you're going after the better stuff, can I remind you that your children, they're like lambs running around. It's like at the church, when we we show up here and and we go do the men's deal and we go to do the women's deal, and we don't don't look at it like this, but it's like we, we just let our kids loose in life. And the enemy's like, yeah, mom and dad's doing good, but watch this. Their kid, their daughter, their son is the one that God's really appointed to change some major stuff. I'm going to attack them. You see, we, we have to be aware of what the enemy does. The thief wants to rob us. Can I tell you what? God's promised us heaven. And there's no reason. There's no reason for us to struggle. There's no reason for us to go to hell because it's all on us. God's done it all. And once we realize that, it's going to be a painful truth for some people. You know, we've always wanted to blame it on everybody else, blame it on our parents, blame it on them, blame it on society, blame it on the system. God's going to say, it's on you. As we understand what's coming, what's coming down the pipe, can I tell you, just, just say yes to it, first of all. Man, this is... Not really a salvation message, but man, it's pretty cut and dry. Man, if you're not sure today, man, I'm begging you. I'm asking you. Make the decision today. God loves you. God sent his son for you. If you're not sure and you say, well, I did it when I was 10, but I really don't know. And I, No. Renew it, man. It's heaven and hell. This is eternity. This is not who sees you. This is not a good week. This is eternity. It's not going to end. And we're all headed there, even no matter what age we are. So we're going to give that option in a minute. But for the rest of us, listen. Could we not understand why we're called to live in a different way? Man, this is, this is man, it's, it, listen. It's, it's not about having a perfect church. It's not about having perfect worship. It's not about all the stuff that we get so entangled in, even in church, man. This is about lives. This is about eternity. This is about souls, man. I remember when God plucked me out of the fire, and I remember when He revealed to me how much He loved me, and I remember the passion that He put upon me, first for my family and first and for those that are closest around me. I just want to share this. Can you feel what I'm saying? This is eternity, and as we know it, and as we accept it, and we understand what's coming, good or bad, would we not have a passion for our neighbors? Would we not have a passion for those people in our life who are teetering, who don't know? This is the mandate that God's put on us, man. Quit thinking that it's just about getting saved. Quit thinking that it's just about showing up at church, man. This is life stuff. This is heaven and hell stuff. God has called us to be the real church. The real church has been changed because of what he's done and we rise up and we begin to live differently instead of looking like the world. And we're willing to go after them and we're willing to serve in a way that others won't serve. What is the Lord saying to you? i got to stop. Father, we love you. I thank you for this day, God. As we're just gathered here today and we just rejoice because it's raining a little bit on the outside. And God, even a message that's not real exciting, some don't want to hear. God, but I pray that you would reign on the inside to know that we don't have anything to fear because you've sent your son Jesus. And so, Lord, in this moment today, I just pray for one or for 20 or for all of us, God, that would say, you know what, I'm not sure. But when you talk about it like that, I want to know that I know that I know that I belong to Jesus, that I'm on the winning team. If you're here today and you doubt or you're not sure or you're wavering or the enemy's barking at you, listen to me. Jesus came and he died for you. It's not about you performing. It's about you accepting what he did and then begin following him. 
you haven't done that or you're just not sure, would you just slip your hand up? Just say, I need Jesus. I want to know that I know. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? God loves you, man. We want to celebrate with you. Let us all know together. I know what it is to be in a point in my life when I struggled, and I wanted to be good enough, and I wanted to think that God loved me, but I just wasn't sure. There's no reason to. We can work through it together. For the rest of us, Lord, as we understand where we're at and we understand what's coming, God, I just pray that you'd burden us to want to share this message, your goodness, love, and mercy, and grace with the world around us, God. Help us to live different challenges, God. For some of us, God, you would set a fire down deep inside of us to want to reach and touch as you would lead. God, I just pray that you would move as we close in worship today. If you raised your hand today for the first time or in a, in a, in a real way, God, please come. We want to pray with you in agreement for the rest of you. What's the Lord saying to you about how you've been going through this and approaching it? Father, we love you. We thank you. If you have other needs or health or whatever, we certainly want to pray with you for healing. Listen to the Lord. Worship his name.